29, to meet the bridegroom. Based on Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. Christ with his disciples is seated upon the Mount of Olives. The sun has set behind the mountains, and the heavens are curtained with the shades of evening. In full view is a dwelling house lighted up brilliantly as if for some festive scene. The light streams from the openings, and an expectant company wait around, indicating that a marriage procession is soon to appear. In many parts of the East, wedding festivities are held in the evening. The bridegroom goes forth to meet his bride and bring her to his home. By torchlight, the bridal party proceed from her father's house to his own, where a feast is provided for the invited guests. In the scene upon which Christ looks, a company are awaiting the appearance of the bridal party, intending to join the procession. Lingering near the bride's house are ten young women robed in white. Each carries a lighted lamp and a small flagon for oil. All are anxiously watching for the appearance of the bridegroom. But there is a delay. Hour after hour passes. The watchers become weary and fall asleep. At midnight the cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. The sleepers, suddenly awaking, spring to their feet. They see the procession moving on, bright with torches and glad with music. They hear the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. The ten maidens seize their lamps and begin to trim them in haste to go forth. But five have neglected to fill their flasks with oil. They did not anticipate so long a delay, and they have not prepared for the emergency. In distress they appeal to their wiser companion, saying, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the waiting five, with their freshly trimmed lamps, have emptied their flagons. They have no oil to spare, and they answer, Not so, lest there be not enough for us and you, but go ye rather to them that sell, and buy for yourselves. While they went to buy, the procession moved on, and left them behind. The five with lighted lamps joined the throng and entered the house with the bridal train, and the door was shut. When the foolish virgins reached the banqueting hall, they received an unexpected denial. The master of the feast declared, I know you not. They were left standing without, in the empty street, in the blackness of the night. As Christ sat looking upon the party that waited for the bridegroom, he told his disciples the story of the ten virgins by their experience illustrating the experience of the church that shall live just before his second coming. The two classes of watchers represent the two classes who profess to be waiting for their Lord. They are called virgins because they profess a pure faith. By the lamps is represented the word of God. The psalmist says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Psalm 119, verse 105. The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. Thus the Spirit is represented in the prophecy of Zechariah. The angel that talked with me came again, he says, and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep, and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold a candlestick all of gold with a bowl upon the top of it, and his seven lamps thereon, and seven pipes to the seven lamps, which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. And I answered again, and said unto him, What be these two olive branches, which through the two golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? Then said he, These are the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Zechariah 4, verses 1 through 14. From the two olive trees the golden oil was emptied through the golden pipes into the bowl of the candlestick and thence into the golden lamps that gave light to the sanctuary. So, from the holy ones that stand in God's presence, His Spirit is imparted to the human instrumentalities who are consecrated to His service. 
The mission of the two anointed ones is to communicate to God's people that heavenly grace which alone can make his word a lamp to their feet and a light to their path. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 4, verse 6. In the parable, all the ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. All had lamps and vessels for oil. For a time there was seen no difference between them. So with the church that lives just before Christ's second coming, all have a knowledge of the Scriptures, all have heard the message of Christ's near approach, and confidently expect His appearing. But as in the parable, so it is now. A time of waiting intervenes. Faith is tried. And when the cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, many are unready. They have no oil in their vessels with their lamps. They are destitute of the Holy Spirit. Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of His Word is of no avail. The theory of truth, unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit, cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Without the enlightenment of the Spirit, men will not be able to distinguish truth from error, and they will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. This class are represented also by the stony ground hearers. They receive the word with readiness, but they fail of assimilating its principles. Its influence is not abiding. The Spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent, implanting in him a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. They do not know God. They have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust how to look and live. Their service to God degenerates into a form. They come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. Ezekiel 33, verse 31. The Apostle Paul points out that this will be the special characteristic of those who live just before Christ's second coming. He says, In the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. This is the class that in time of peril are found crying, peace and safety. They lull their hearts into security and dream not of danger. When startled from their lethargy, they discern their destitution and entreat others to supply their lack, but in spiritual things no man can make up another's deficiency. The grace of God has been freely offered to every soul. The message of the gospel has been heralded, let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Revelation 22, verse 17. But character is not transferable. No man can believe for another. No man can receive the Spirit for another. No man can impart to another the character which is the fruit of the Spirit's working. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, that is the land, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Ezekiel 14, verse 20. It is in a crisis that character is revealed. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, and the sleeping virgins were roused from their slumbers, it was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares, but one was prepared for the emergency, and the other was found without preparation. So now, a sudden and unlooked-for calamity, 
something that brings the soul face to face with death, will show whether there is any real faith in the promises of God. It will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great final test comes at the close of human probation, when it will be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. The ten virgins are watching in the evening of this earth's history. All claim to be Christians. All have a call, a name, a lamp, and all profess to be doing God's service. All apparently wait for Christ's appearing, but five are unready. Five will be found surprised, dismayed, outside the banquet hall. At the final day, many will claim admission to Christ's kingdom, saying, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? But the answer is, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me. Luke thirteen twenty six and 27 and Matthew seven twenty two. In this life they have not entered into fellowship with Christ. Therefore they know not the language of heaven. They are strangers to its joy. What man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the spirit of God. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 11. Saddest of all words that ever fell on mortal ear are those words of doom, I know you not. The fellowship of the Spirit which you have slighted could alone make you one with the joyous throng at the marriage feast. In that scene you cannot participate. Its light would fall on blinded eyes, its melody upon deaf ears, its love and joy could awake no chord of gladness in the world-benumbed heart. You are shut out from heaven by your own unfitness for its companionship. We cannot be ready to meet the Lord by waking when the cry is heard, Behold the bridegroom, and then gathering up our empty lamps to have them replenished. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven. In the parable, the wise virgins had oil in their vessels with their lamps. Their light burned with undimmed flame through the night of watching. It helped to swell the illumination for the bridegroom's honor, shining out in the darkness. It helped to illuminate the way to the home of the bridegroom, to the marriage feast. So the followers of Christ are to shed light into the darkness of the world. Through the Holy Spirit, God's word is a light as it becomes a transforming power in the life of the receiver. By implanting in their hearts the principles of his word, the Holy Spirit develops in men the attributes of God. The light of His glory, His character, is to shine forth in His followers. Thus they are to glorify God, to lighten the path to the bridegroom's home, to the city of God, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. The coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, the darkest hour. So the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history, the days of Noah and Lot pictured the condition of the world just before the coming of the Son of Man. The scriptures pointing forward to this time declare that Satan will work with all power and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness, 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 9 and 10. His working is plainly revealed by the rapidly increasing darkness, the multitudinous errors, heresies, and delusions of these last days. Not only is Satan leading the world captive, but his deceptions are leavening the professed churches of our Lord Jesus Christ. The great apostasy will develop into darkness deep as midnight, impenetrable as sackcloth of hair. To God's people it will be a night of trial, a night of weeping, a night of persecution for the truth's sake. But out of that night of darkness God's light will shine. He causes the light to shine out of darkness, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. When the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep, the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, Let there be light, and there was light, Genesis 1, verses 2 and 3. So, in the night of spiritual darkness, God's word goes forth, Let there be light. To his people he says, 
Arise, shine, for thy light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Behold, says the Scripture, the darkness shall cover the earth and gross darkness the people, but the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. Isaiah 60, verse 2. It is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. This is the work outlined by the prophet Isaiah in the words, O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid, say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God, behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Isaiah 40, verses 9 and 10. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold, your God. The last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world, is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. The light of the Son of Righteousness is to shine forth in good works, in words of truth, and deeds of holiness. Christ, the outshining of the Father's glory, came to the world as its light. He came to represent God to men, and of him it is written that he was anointed with the Holy Ghost and with power, and went about doing good. Acts 10, verse 38. In the synagogue at Nazareth, he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Luke 4, verses 18 and 19. This was the work he commissioned his disciples to do. Ye are the light of the world, he said. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Matthew 5, verses 14 and 16. This is the work which the prophet Isaiah describes when he says, Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry, and that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house? When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him, and that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh? Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward." Isaiah 58, verses 7 and 8. Thus, in the night of spiritual darkness, God's glory is to shine forth through his church in lifting up the bowed down and comforting those that mourn. All around us are heard the wails of a world's sorrow. On every hand are the needy and distressed. It is ours to aid in relieving and softening life's hardships and misery. Practical work will have far more effect than mere sermonizing. We are to give food to the hungry, clothing to the naked, and shelter to the homeless. And we are called to do more than this. The wants of the soul only the love of Christ can satisfy. If Christ is abiding in us, our hearts will be full of divine sympathy. The sealed fountains of earnest Christ-like love will be unsealed. God calls not only for our gifts for the needy, but for our cheerful countenance, our hopeful words, our kindly handclasp. When Christ healed the sick, he laid his hands upon them. So should we come in close touch with those whom we seek to benefit. There are many from whom hope has departed. Bring back the sunshine to them. Many have lost their courage. Speak to them words of cheer. Pray for them. There are those who need the bread of life. Read to them from the word of God. Upon many is a soul sickness which no earthly balm can reach nor physician heal. Pray for these souls. Bring them to Jesus. Tell them that there is a balm in Gilead and a physician there. 
Light is a blessing, a universal blessing, pouring forth its treasures on a world unthankful, unholy, demoralized. So it is with the light of the Son of Righteousness. The whole earth, wrapped as it is in the darkness of sin and sorrow and pain, is to be lighted with the knowledge of God's love. From no sect, rank, or class of people is the light shining from heaven's throne to be excluded. The message of hope and mercy is to be carried to the ends of the earth. Whosoever will may reach forth and take hold of God's strength and make peace with him, and he shall make peace. No longer are the heathen to be wrapped in midnight darkness. The gloom is to disappear before the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. The power of hell has been overcome. But no man can impart that which he himself has not received. In the work of God, humanity cannot originate nothing. No man can by his own effort make himself a light-bearer for God. It was the golden oil emptied by the heavenly messengers into the golden tubes to be conducted from the golden bowl into the lamps of the sanctuary that produced a continuous bright and shining light. It is the love of God, continually transferred to man, that enables him to impart light. Into the hearts of all who are united to God by faith, the golden oil of love flows freely to shine out again in good works, in real heartfelt service for God. In the great and measureless gift of the Holy Spirit are contained all of heaven's resources. It is not because of any restriction on the part of God that the riches of His grace do not flow earthward to men. If all were willing to receive, all would become filled with His Spirit. It is the privilege of every soul to be a living channel through which God can communicate to the world the treasures of His grace, the unsearchable riches of Christ. There is nothing that Christ desires so much as agents who will represent to the world His spirit and character. There is nothing that the world needs so much as the manifestation through humanity of the Savior's love. All heaven is waiting for channels through which can be poured the holy oil to be a joy and blessing to human hearts. Christ has made every provision that his church shall be a transformed body, illumined with the light of the world, possessing the glory of Emmanuel. It is his purpose that every Christian shall be surrounded with a spiritual atmosphere of light and peace. He desires that we shall reveal his own joy in our lives. The indwelling of the Spirit will be shown by the outflowing of heavenly love. The divine fullness will flow through the consecrated human agent to be given forth to others. The Son of Righteousness has healing in his wings, Malachi 4, verse 2. So from every true disciple is to be diffused an influence for life, courage, helpfulness, and true healing. The religion of Christ means more than the forgiveness of sin. It means taking away our sins and filling the vacuum with the graces of the Holy Spirit. It means divine illumination, rejoicing in God. It means a heart emptied of self and blessed with the abiding presence of Christ. When Christ reigns in the soul, there is purity, freedom from sin. The glory, the fullness, the completeness of the gospel plan is fulfilled in the life the acceptance of the Savior brings a glow of perfect peace, perfect love, perfect assurance. The beauty and fragrance of the character of Christ revealed in the life testifies that God has indeed sent His Son into the world to be its Savior. Christ does not bid His followers strive to shine. He says, let your light shine. If you have received the grace of God, the light is in you. Remove the obstructions, and the Lord's glory will be revealed. The light will shine forth to penetrate and dispel the darkness. You cannot help shining within the range of your influence. The revelation of His own glory in the form of humanity will bring heaven so near to men that the beauty adorning the inner temple will be seen in every soul in whom the Savior dwells. Men will be captivated by the glory of an abiding Christ, and in currents of praise and thanksgiving from the many souls thus won to God, glory will flow back to the great giver. Arise, shine, 
for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. Isaiah 60, verse 1. To those who go out to meet the bridegroom is this message given. Christ is coming with power and great glory. He is coming with his own glory and with the glory of the Father. He is coming with all the holy angels with him. While all the world is plunged in darkness, there will be light in every dwelling of the saints. They will catch the first light of his second appearing. The unsullied light will shine from his splendor, and Christ the Redeemer will be admired by all who have served him. While the wicked flee from his presence, Christ's followers will rejoice. The patriarch Job, looking down to the time of Christ's second advent, said, Whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not a stranger. Job 19.27 To his faithful followers, Christ has been a daily companion and a familiar friend. They have lived in close contact, in constant communion with God. Upon them the glory of the Lord has risen. In them the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ has been reflected. Now they rejoice in the undimmed rays of the brightness and glory of the King and His Majesty. They are prepared for the communion of heaven, for they have heaven in their hearts. With uplifted heads, with the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness shining upon them, with rejoicing that their redemption draweth nigh, they go forth to meet the bridegroom, saying, Lo, this is our God, we have waited for him, and he will save us. Isaiah 25, verse 9. From Revelation 19, 6 through 9 and 17, verse 14, we read, And I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of mighty thundering, saying, Alleluia, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. He is Lord of lords, and King of kings, and they that are with him are called, and chosen, and faithful.